Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our special meeting this evening. Will everyone please rise for the clerk or for the invocation to be delivered by our clerk, Jeff Hall. Almighty God, creator of all and judge over all, we pray thee to guide our work in this meeting and in all our duties. We pray for our officers and members of this legislature who serve and guard the welfare of the citizens of this community, that by thy blessing they may be enabled to discharge their duties honestly and well. We pray that by thy help they may observe the strictest justice and preserve untarnished our loyalty to our county and to thee. Amen. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Legislator Pratt. Thank you. Will the clerk please take the roll? Mr. Fields. Present. Bruzo. Absent. Ms. Pratt. Present. Ms. Present. King. Present. Mr. Constantine. Here. Ms. Gatta. Mr. Sosha. Here. Mr. Pascarella. Here. Mr. Paterni. Present. Ms. Ostelich. Here. Ms. Milano. Here. Mr. McGarry. Excused. Mr. Hughes. Present. Mr. McDonald. Here. Mr. Jasinski. Present. 13 present, one absent, one excused. Thank you. Our first order of business this evening is a public hearing on proposed local lot B of 2021. What we'll purpose read the notice of this evening's public hearing? Please take notice that pursuant to Section 20 of the Municipal Home Rule Law, a public hearing is hereby called upon proposed local lot D of 2021 to be held before the legislature of the County of Schenectady in the legislative chambers in the county office building, 620 State Street, Schenectady, New York, on the fourth day of October 2021 at 7 p.m for the purpose of hearing all interested persons on the question of proposed local law D of 2021 entitled Local Law Amending Chapter 125 Health Code Schenectady County Sanitary Code of the, of the Schenectady County Codified Laws to amend regulations related to body art. Thank you, any members of the public present tonight who would like to address the public hearing? Any members of the public present who would like to address the public hearing? Any members of the public wishing to address the public hearing? Seeing none, with the clerk, please read any, read any public comments submitted in writing relating to the proposed local law D. There were no comments submitted. Thank you. No comments. Public hearing is closed. I'll now call to order our special meeting to, and ask the clerk to read the notice of special meeting. Please take notice that pursuant to subdivision 3 of section 2.03 of article 2 of the administrative code of the county of Schenectady, there is hereby called a special meeting of the county legislature by the clerk thereof at the direction of Chair Anthony Jasinski Sr. to it. There shall be a special meeting of the Schenectady County Legislature on Tuesday, October 4th, 2021 at 7 p.m. by the call of Chair Anthony Jasinski Sr. in the Legislative Chambers, Schenectady County Office Building 620 State Street, Schenectady, New York, for consideration of a resolution calling for a public hearing on Schenectady County 2022 program budget and 2022 through 2027 capital improvement program. Thank you. First item this evening is Resolution 132-21, Sponsors of the Committee on Rules, the clerk will read. Resolution calling for a public hearing on the Schenectady County 2022 Program Budget and 2022 through 2027 Capital Improvement Program. Any discussion? See now, the clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Fields. Aye. Mr. Ruzzo was absent. Ms. Pratt. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Mr. Constantine. Yes. Ms. Gatta. Yes. Mr. Sosha. Yes. Mr. Pascarella. Yes. Mr. Paterni. Aye. Ms. Ostlich. Yes. Ms. Milano. Yes. Mr. McGarry is excused. Mr. Hughes. Aye. Mr. McDonald. Yes. Mr. Jasinski. Aye. 13 aye, one absent, one excused. Thank you. The resolution is passed. Again, we'll note for the record that the budget hearing will be held on Tuesday, October 12th at 7 o'clock p.m. in the legislative chambers in this, uh, in this room. This concludes our business for this evening. Is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. Aye. Special meeting is adjourned. We'll now move to our first committee meeting this evening, which is the Committee on Health and Human Services to be chaired by Legislator Osterlich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I call the Committee on Health and Human Services to order. We have one item on the agenda this evening. First item is a resolution regarding the acceptance of monies from the New York State Office of Addiction Services and Supports and the New York State Office of Mental Health. And we have County Manager Rory Fluman. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. 
So this is uh, an extension of monies. Uh, remember one year ago uh, when the pandemic was kind of just getting started, the state came through and notified us that we would be reduced 20% on our OMH and OASIS lines of revenues coming in from the state. They further backed off to 5%. Um, these are really small adjustments across uh, multiple programs through OMH and OASIS uh, accounts having to do uh, with addiction, housing, uh, and, and our efforts in those areas. So the ask is to accept these uh, monies from OMH and OASIS. Are there any questions? Is there a report? Let's see here, a first, a second? Second. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, the initiative is reported to the floor. This concludes our business for this evening and the Committee on Health and Human Services is now closed. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. Our next committee is the Committee on Labor and Civil Service to be chaired by Legislator Sosha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Call the order to Committee on Labor and Civil Service. I have one item this evening, it's LCS 20, which is a resolution to create uh, certain positions at the Schenectady County Public Health Service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an extension of the uh, grant that we received from the State Health Department uh, for testing in our schools. Uh, we are geared up right now uh, to provide pool testing, which is not the discriminant testing for COVID-19, uh, where you test each individual. The pool testing is, is where you uh, take 20 different samples, and these are, are, are samples taken by a, a, uh, someone at the school who's been trained to supervise the sample, just like you might have at CVS or uh, at a pharmacy where a person is self-swabbing, putting it into a sealed package, that package going to the lab, the expense of, again, in testing, it's not necessarily the swab or the people that are doing it, but it's, it's, there's a lot of fees uh, in regards to uh, when the sample itself gets to the lab. So with pool testing, instead of just testing each specimen, you're testing 20 at one time, and mathematically, if there's a problem, then you go back and you retest the 20. It's a much cheaper way to do it, but it's also well accepted. Uh, this is something SUNY Schenectady did all year and they did it across the SUNY system. So when the state came through and gave us that $4 million to begin the testing in our schools, uh, uh, the recommendation was the pool testing. Uh, we have started testing with our schools. Uh, we all have all but one district uh, onboarded and ready to go. The districts themselves are starting uh, with their employees and their teachers with pool testing and they're slowly gonna phase in their kids. There are a lot of different levels of interaction from our health department uh, as far as just uh, necessitating all the paperwork or uh, proper uh, sign-offs and or parental notifications and those kind of things that this testing was happening. There's been a lot of exchanges between our public health and our school districts. Um, this action is completely supported by that $4 million. So it is a, an ask to add these two nursing positions and the one epidemiologist position. Um, they're also gonna carry forward into the 2022 budget year. Are there any questions? Just um, following up, is there an issue with the one school district or is it just timing? Uh, they're, they're just having discussions amongst themselves. You know, there's still maybe some time. They're, they're always welcome to, to join, um, but they're having some sincere discussions about uh, the rights and wrongs of testing kids in schools. Okay, thank you. I have a motion, is there a second? Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, LCS 20 is moved. And that concludes our business this evening. Committee on Labor, Labor and Civil Service is closed. <clears throat> Thank you. Next committee is the Committee on Public Facilities, Transportation, and Infrastructure to be chaired by Legislator Paterni. Chairman, thank you. I'd like to call to order the Committee on Public Facilities, Transportation, and Infrastructure. This evening we have three items on the agenda. The first is a resolution to amend the 2021 Capital Improvement Program to provide funding for a streetscape project for certain county buildings. County Manager Fluman. Thank you, sir. This uh, streetscape project was something that was authorized by this body back in 2019. Uh, the last picture of the description of, of this process uh, is gonna be the end result of this project. 
It's completely doing curbs, sidewalks, uh, and some of the, the foliage and trees uh, all the way from the CDTA bus stop, all the way around the front of our building, all the way just right up to, the, to uh, uh, where the um, parking lot entrance is. Uh, we have just a lot of uh, crumbling sidewalk out there. It's gonna completely upgrade the project. Problem is, is since 2019, whether it's pandemic related, a lot of the materials and expenses have increased in costs. Um, we're also gonna be adding onto this project. Uh, if, if you have ever get a chance to look at the courthouse, some of the marble is falling off the side of the building. And we've had accounts where we're going to address that, but the costs of masonry and uh, all these projects that have gone out to bid came back uh, extremely higher than anticipated. So we're able to, just like we did in our last budget year, sweep some accounts, we built some money, to finish the streetscape project and uh, the marble project on the courthouse. Um, but the ask tonight is, is for the extra money so that we can uh, complete the projects, the $275,000. Questions? That's an appropriation from surplus, I assume. That is correct. Move to report. Is there a second? Second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Our second item on the agenda this evening is a resolution regarding the circa determination for roadway improvements at the intersection of Rosendale Road and Old River Road in the town of Niskuna. We have Paul Sheldon with us to uh, help explain. Uh, we're in the final stages of the preliminary design phase of the Rosendale Road, Old River Road intersection improvement project. This phase required us to develop three feasible alternatives and identify and assess their social, economic, and environmental impacts. Three alternatives were progressed through NEPA and SEEKER process. Alternatives one and two were a T configuration with either a traffic signal or a stop controlled intersection. Alternative three would replace the current intersection with a roundabout. On February 11, 2021, the proposed project alternatives were presented at a virtual public information meeting. The public was asked to provide comments at the meeting as well as provide written comments for 30 days after the meeting. The county received over 60 comments regarding this project. The grant specifically targets reduction of vehicle emissions through congestion mitigation. However, improving the safety of the intersection was also a high priority. The intersection currently has a crash rate five times the state average. The average signal and stop controlled intersection do not meet the required objectives of reducing emissions and addressing the safety. The roundabout alternative meets the vehicle emission guidelines as well as providing the greatest safety improvements by introducing traffic calming. Impacts to adjacent homes have been minimized to the greatest extent possible. However, one single family home will need to be re relocated on its existing property. Any mitigation requirements, if necessary, will be adhered to as part of the structure relocation efforts. Uh, we will continue to work with homeowners throughout the design and construction, mitigate any visual noise and construction impacts due to the project. Replacement of removed vegetation due to construction and we're providing additional landscaping will be part of the mitigation process. Uh, New York State Historic Preservation Office has reviewed the Phase 1A Archaeological Survey report for the project site and has recommended completion of a Phase B, which we discussed at a previous meeting. This archaeological study is actually starting this week. The project is also outside the limits of any known rare or state listed animals or plants. Any land clearing will occur outside the dates would also could, af could affect the northern long-eared bats. After review of full environmental assessment form, criteria within seeker regulations, New York State Historic Preservation Office, New York State DEC, it has been determined that the proposed roundabout alternative will not have a significant adverse impact on the environment. As project sponsor and seeker lead agency, or we were requesting authorization for seeker approval. Once we receive approval, we will request authorization from New York State DOT and Federal Highway to begin final design and right away acquisition. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions? Move to report. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The resolution is moved. And our final resolution for this evening for this committee is a resolution authorizing the county purchasing agent to offer for sale surplus equipment. Andrew Fluman. So every year uh, we come to this body to ask to put certain items uh, into surplus for auction. This year we've got about 20 vehicles and another 12 pieces of machinery or public works and facilities equipment uh, that we're looking to auction off. Just asking for approval from this body. Move to report. Is there a second? Second? Second. 
Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That is also moved. And that concludes our business for the Committee on Public Facilities, Transportation, and Infrastructure. Thank you, sir. Our next committee is the Committee on Home Safety and Firefighting to be chaired by Legislator Constantine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Call to order the Committee on Public Safety and Firefighting. Three items tonight. The first two are informational presentations. So I'll start with seniority and good looks. Our Sheriff Dominic D'Agostino and uh, Under Sheriff James Barrett is with them, and I'll let him start the presentation and introduce his staff accordingly. How's that? Better? Um, tonight, we were prepared to uh, make two presentations, one regarding the narcotics unit and the second one regarding the street crimes unit. Uh, we'll start off with the narcotics unit, Inspector Foster. Um, the narcotics unit's been in existence since 2016 when Inspector Foster came on board with us. Um, they've done some great work here in the county. Um, the past year and a half has been rather challenging. Uh, given uh, the, the COVID epidemic and also some issues with ale reform and discovery issues. But uh, we'll, without further ado, we'll have Inspector Foster come up and present for us. Yeah, I'll move over for you. Good evening. How is everybody? Um, I was here uh, three years ago to give a presentation. Um, I'll apologize beforehand. It's going to be a bit repetitive if you were here. Um, if you weren't here three years ago, um, it's going to be awesome. So, <laughs> so just, just bear with me. Um, again, if you weren't here, who are we? Um, as, as the sheriff said, my name is Chris Foster. I'm an inspector with the sheriff's office. Uh, I'm in charge of the narcotics unit. The narcotics unit is made up my, of myself, two investigators from the district attorney's office, two investigators from the sheriff's department, and one investigator from uh, the Rotterdam Police Department. Uh, what, what is it we do specifically? Um, I think our job description can be most aptly described as we work to identify, target, and ultimately disrupt and dismantle drug distribution networks within Schenectady County. Um, we will go um, outside of Schenectady County as, as cases dictate, but um, for the most part, we're charged to uh, take care of the county here. Before I get into that, um, so some of the, um, how do we go about our job? Um, just real loosely, um, uh, we employ a lot of uh, different investigative techniques uh, in a narcotics investigation, um, including but not limited to uh, um, water taps, um, electronic surveillance, tracking, uh, and really the bread and butter of any narcotics unit is controlled buys. Um, I'll, I'll try to uh, give a loose def definition. A controlled buy is basically what it sounds like. It's a controlled purchase of narcotics from an identified target from either an under undercover officer or an undercover operative who is working with us. Um, we will have either, either the, the operative uh, contact the target, uh, arrange a meet. Um, the, the operative will be fitted with uh, electronic device, a tracker, a recorder, and a transmitter. Uh, they'll also be given serialized money that we have to purchase uh, the product. Um, they'll meet with the, with the target. Uh, we will surreptitiously surveil and record uh, that transaction. When the transaction is over, we'll retrieve the informant or the operative. Uh, we'll retrieve the product that they bought. We'll document it, we'll tag it, and um, we'll prepare for prosecution. C 
control by. Um, the chart um, breaks it down into, into drugs. Uh, you can see uh, from 16 on um, our, our concentration uh, was on heroin. It is a scourge. Uh, it is ruining communities. It is killing people. Uh, that's our focus. That's been our focus since we've been here. Um, you know, but like I said before, um, we do not ignore the other drugs. Um, we will target uh, cocaine. We will target crack. We'll, if you name it, we'll target it. Um, I, I said the last time I was here, um, if you're selling it in Schenectady County, we'll buy it. Um, uh, we, we're, we're aggressive. Um, just to touch base on 20 and 21. Uh, 20, you can see, um, certainly took a downturn. Uh, in the beginning of 2020, uh, they in enacted bail reform, uh, which impacted us in uh, how we do our job. Um, and then a couple months later, the world ended. So that impacted us too. So um, you can see 21, we're trying to um, get our legs back underneath us and uh, we're doing okay. The yellow bar in the graph is search warrants. The orange bar is arrests. Uh, I described before, search warrants are an invaluable tool to us in a, a narcotics investigation. They afford us the opportunity to seize large quantities of narcotics as well as proceeds and um, uh, handguns. Handguns, since, since 2016, uh, when I got there, um, we have recovered, seized, or purchased those. Uh, 22 handguns, two reported stolen, five are ghost guns. I'm gonna be touching on ghost guns um, in a little bit. Uh, 13 assault rifles recovered, 10 reported stolen. 15 automatic, fully automatic machine gun assault rifles, ghost guns. Uh, four shotguns, thousands of rounds of ammunition, 30 magazines, four silencer suppressors, and one bulletproof vest. Again, those are all firearms and um, equipment that we either seized uh, or purchased. Currency. Again, so 16. Uh, we have seized over 300,000 in cash. Uh, most of that cash w was taken in search warrants. Um, pursuant to an investigation, a narcotics investigation. Uh, some of it is taken off um, a target, incident to arrest. Some of it um, has been recovered uh, on a vehicle, on a vehicle stop, subject to arrest. But for the most part, uh, the majority, probably 80% of uh, that 300,000 was taken in search warrants. Uh, Interesting case. We were dealing with an informant uh, just prior to the to the pandemic. Um, informant was uh, reputable. Uh, had done some work for us already. Uh, they were buying heroin, and uh, on this particular day, they told us about a a, a target that they were dealing with. Um, we'll call him street name of Prince. Uh, Described Prince as a uh, regular heroin uh, dealer. Uh, this informant had bought from them numerous times in the past. Um, uh, and he dry, drove a blue Impala. We had the informant contact Prince. Prince showed up. Uh, we went through our, our procedures. Um, and the informant bought that. That's about 70 bags. Uh, that's about seven bundles. Um, heroin is sold in, in bags, individual bags. Uh, they then pack them into packages of 10 and wrap them in, in um, little rubber bands. And you can see each rubber band pack is 10 bags of heroin. Um, that's called a bundle. There's probably about seven bundles in there. Uh, when we did this case, um, you know, nothing really remarkable about this target that we could find. Um, you know, we did the buy, and, and the plan for him was to uh, do another buy the next week and arrest him and move on. Um, that changed. 
after that, by um, we started continuing on our um, existing cases, which took us all over, um, really, the Capital District, primarily in the city, some in Rotterdam. Um, it was almost immediately after um, we, we bought that buy from Prince that we were doing a case, um, I think it was in the Bellevue, and um, we were approached by a source over there we were working with, and they started talking to us about Prince, a guy named Prince. Blue Impala sells a lot of heroin, okay? Um, we had a case in Mount Pleasant right around the same time. Uh, different source starts talking about Prince. Blue Impala sells a lot of heroin. We went to the stockade, uh, same thing. S North side, Union seat, Street, Central State Street, everywhere we went into the city, everybody was talking about Prince. We took a step back. Um, started talking, started to think a little bit, and uh, we got curious what, what we were dealing with. Uh, we sat down, we completed an app, a Title III application for a lifetime tracking device, which is a court-ordered um, application that's approved that would allow us to put a lifetime tracking device on this individual, individual's car and follow him on a computer to see what he does. Uh, we received that order. Uh, we went over to his house one night late, um, snuck under his car, slapped the, uh, the tracker on, and then just went to bed. Next morning, we went to work, turned the computer on, and we saw, I'll describe as follows. Um, Prince woke up, he lived in Iskuna. He woke up at eight o'clock. He left his house at 8.30. He drove to, uh, I believe it was Salina in Avenue A, and uh, because it was, uh, he had a lifetime tracker, we were able to track him on the computer. Uh, we were following him, loosely. Uh, he went to Salina in Avenue A. Uh, when, when he was driving towards the intersection, there were five people on a corner. Uh, he parked on the corner. Within 10 to 15 seconds, there was 10 to 15 people in a single file line lined up outside his driver's side window. Um, we watched, boom, inside, hand, 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 hand. 15 people were gone in less than five minutes and he was gone. Um, he left uh, Van Branken area and he went to, to Mount Pleasant. Same thing, nondescript corner, five people already waiting. He parks, 10 to 15 people in 10 seconds. Uh, same thing, boom, 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 boom. He's, he's out in five minutes and he, he's gone. He left there, he went to Woodlawn, same thing. He went to Goose Hill, same thing. He went to the north side, same thing. He went, he went to Rotterdam, same thing. Then he went home. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. He had served anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 bags before lunch. He went home, had lunch, unloaded his money, that he had made that day. He re-upped and he went back out at noon and he did the same thing. And he stayed on the same schedule. Salinas, Mount Pleasant, same street corners, same thing, same amount of people. We watched him and we didn't even stay with him all day. He must have served anywhere on that one day. 350 to 400 people, one person. One person. Um, we were um, shocked, to say the least. Uh, because of his, his um, I guess, aggressiveness, uh, the amount of weight he was moving, uh, it, it was decided we were going to move on him quickly and not leave him out there. Uh, we did a quick buy, uh, another quick buy into him. Um, we took him off on a vehicle stop, arrested him. We had uh, written a search warrant for his house. Uh, we went to the house, executed it. And let's check it out. This is his house. Um, nice, nondescript, Cape Cod and Iskuna. That's a file cabinet. That's a file cabinet with about 25 to 30,000 in it. That's a crawl space to a bedroom. You can see the door frame. To the lower right is a strong box. You 
inside the strong box was a bag. Inside the bag was the butt of a handgun. Underneath that, those are fentanyl patches. Um, this individual was either selling the fentanyl patches or he was using them to extract fentanyl to treat his, his heroin, to cut it. Underneath that, that right there is a kilo of raw heroin. Pressed into cubes. Um, for, j just for some, uh, some context and, and perspective, um, a kilo of raw heroin sounds like a lot of heroin, and it is. But, you know, the, on TV, you hear about kilos all the time. Um, I've been doing this for, for 33 years. You know, in my office, I, I have narcotics investigators with over 100 years' experience. We have never seen uh, a full kilo uh, of heroin. Uh, moreover, we were advised after this seizure that that kilo um, was, and I believe still is, the largest raw heroin seizure in the history of Schenectady County. Um, that's a lot of heroin. The fact that he was doing what he was doing alone with, with that weight blows me away, blows me away. That's a money counter, uh, very rare to find a money counter. Um, when you find one, um, you, you're, you're dealing with somebody that's dealing with um, high six figures, maybe seven. Um, we've seen them before. He, doing the math with this individual, he was probably doing that easy. And that was his handgun. That's a 357 snub nose. It was loaded. Uh, Prince is in prison. <laughs> um, he's all done. Um, if I could just speak to, to, to him a little bit. Um, again, I. I, I like, I don't even know if I can put into to the words what, like, we've seen, like, six-man crews um, running heroin organizations that weren't doing half the, the work that this guy was doing alone. Um, it, it really is incredible what he was doing. Um, uh, in, incredibly stupid. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly not going to sit here. I don't want to be on record as, as telling anybody the, the, the smart way to... to um, traffic in a kilo, but uh, uh, I'll tell you the stupid way, and, and that was it. Um, he's in prison. Successful case, to the least. Uh, another interesting case. We, we, we were dealing with, with, a, with an informant at the time who was um, uh, doing good work. Providing what, what we were describing to be uh, mid to major dealers. Uh, we describe them as, as somebody who's uh, routinely capable of moving uh, ounces or multiple ounces and will rarely sell below ounces. Um, this person was providing that. Um, uh, they had put a couple targets on, on, on the table for us. Um, we were doing some good work with them. And then one day they uh, we were working with them and they and they said, hey, and they told us a story. And the story was this. He said, look, he goes, I know I'm doing this work. He goes, but uh, he goes, I did um, a federal bid uh, in a federal penitentiary years ago. He said, uh, uh, I did it with a guy who has since got out. Uh, that guy lives in Fulton County. He described him as a machinist by trade, uh, lives on a farm out there. The reason he was telling us this is uh, he said that this individual had recently started a ghost gun manufacturing business. Ghost guns. Um, I'll, I'll try to give just like a real loose definition of what they are. I'm sure you've seen them in the news. Um, Again, loosely, 
the guns that um, officers carry, Glocks, um, any Glock, you can take a Glock and break it down. That gun will break down into five pieces. Each five pieces has a serial number on it. Um, the barrel has it. Sometimes you can find it, sometimes you can't. But every piece of that gun has a serial number. It is traceable. Um, any piece of that gun is traceable. Um, you can try to deface it. You cannot. You can try and grind it off. Um, they'll retrieve it with uh, a spectrometer or acid. Um, you can't remove it. Uh, a ghost gun is, there are um, companies, websites around the world, um, some reputable, most not where you can, if you know how, purchase pieces of guns. So Glock 23, uh, for example, five pieces. All right, I'll buy the barrel from this company in Belarus. I'll buy the, the slide from a place in Russia, you know, someplace else. I'll, but I'll buy them all in pieces. None of them will have serial numbers. None of them will be traceable. None of them are identified. You get those pieces in the mail, you put them together, you have a fully functioning Glock 23 and untraceable. That's a ghost gun. Um, so he tells us this. He says uh, he, he wants me to start moving, his story was to our guy, I want you to use your contacts with the gang affiliated drug dealers in Schenectady, let them know that I have these untraceable guns, and I want to start supplying them. He came to us, told us his story. Um, the ghost gun thing, I had read about ghost guns. We had never seen a ghost gun. Um, we know they're around, but you know, we um, took his story a little skeptical, but we figured why not? You know, if, if half of what he's saying is true, it's worth a case. Uh, we had him contact this guy. Uh, they met. This guy was going to bring down some samples. If we liked them, uh, we were going to buy them. Uh, he came to Schenectady. He met our guy, and we bought this. That's a 9 millimeter Ruger semi-automatic handgun. That is not a ghost gun. I believe that was stolen out of North Carolina. Um, the thing on the front of that is a, is a factory machined silencer or sound suppressor. Um, anybody that's ever seen a movie growing up, you, you've seen those, you know, bad guy takes a gun out, screws it on, boom. Like, you pretty much, have to, just from watching TVs and movies, you think they're everywhere. Um, again, 30 years or for me, 100 years experience in my office, nobody in my office has ever seen a, uh, a silencer in the field, ever. Um, after we bought this, uh, I contacted the, the ATF. Um, they came down, we met, uh, we went over the case particulars. Uh, he was deemed to be an appropriate federal target for um, gun man manufacturing, and uh, we proceeded and, and worked with them. Um, we called contact, we had our guy contact the target, um, bring down some more stuff, we like it, we'll buy it, we bought this. Those are five fully automatic M16 machine guns. They are totally untraceable. There are no serial numbers to be found. There are no identifying marks. Those guns do not exist. Those are ghost guns. That is a suppressor for a fully automatic M16. And in the lower right, it's about three ounces of Coke that we bought. bought again from this guy. That's two fully automatic M16s, fully untraceable over three Glock 23. They are also ghost guns. No serial numbers. They don't exist. They are all over a Uzi submachine gun, fully automatic, totally untraceable. No serial numbers. That gun doesn't exist. Bought some more. That's five, again, fully automatic M16 machine guns with clips. Go 
Those are ghost guns. They don't exist. And then we finished up with that. Two more M16s. Um, you know, it can't be overstated that, that th this individual's initial plan was to access our guys' con connections in the gang community in Schenectady and provide them with fully automatic, sound suppressed machine guns. And if anybody's got something scarier than that, I'm all ears. We, um, we did a search warrant on his place out, out in Fulton County. Um, we found exactly what you'd think, uh, gun making, just guns everywhere. I mean, this guy, he had just started up and running um, uninterrupted, uh, frightening, to say the least. He was back in federal prison. That was an interesting place. Uh, it's just other agencies. Um, narcotics, as uh, narcotics agencies are, are, are competitive as a rule. They just are. Um, there is also an extreme amount of cooperation between us. All those agencies, uh, to name just a few, and there's some off of that. Um, we've worked with all of them on, on cases that we needed help with. And uh, I, I, I stated before, conversely, we've been, we've been contacted by all those agencies, agencies on numerous occasions to help them with their cases. Um, cooperative. That's my thank you page. I want to thank everybody here. Um, you know, and I said this the last time. Uh, you know, it's it, it's not an easy job, but but it's necessary. Uh, we, we enjoy it, and uh, we appreciate the support, specifically from this body. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Questions, comments. So I just want to thank you, Inspector, for uh, a great presentation. Um, I, I was here three years ago, and it still is a wow factor. So we appreciate the efforts that um, uh, the force, your team, uh, and the sheriff, uh, and the combined arms of all the com um, competing yet uh, collaborating agencies bring to our community. When I think about, um, you know, I think Back in 2015, 2016, we said, let's put a big sign out that says, you know, if you want to do business here when it comes to drugs or guns, you know, we're going to we're gonna take you down. And it's clear to me that in 2016, we took 158K off the streets, and ever since, it's been 30 or 40, which means to me that you guys are really putting the effort in. Um, I'm concerned about those ghost guns. I'm concerned about the impact uh, that they can have uh, in our community to the safety of, of the, the sheriffs and the deputies and the others that are out there protecting us. And I'm really concerned about fentanyl. And so what are the things that we can do? Because you do have our support. You certainly have my support. But what can we do to help you with tools, techniques, and training so that we're not exposed to what, what happens if that was a kilo of fentanyl and you know the officer opened it up or the canine opened it up? I, th I think you're dead, right, in that moment? So what do we do to help you? That's a tough one, Rich. Um, you know, other than continued support, um, you know, I really can't think of anything right now. You know, um, you, you know, I think Don, uh, the sheriff said last time, you know, when we don't ask for much, um, but when we do, uh, we need it. And and we, we've been fortunate that when we have come to this body um, with with requests, um, we, we've been happy. Appreciate that. We appreciate that, that the people in this room um, appreciate the need. And, uh, you know, but thank you. Keep doing the work. Thank you. I also would like to thank you for your presentation and, and all that you do. My comment is it, it's just a comment. Um, that area that you talked about with Prince that was at Salina and Avenue A. 
is directly across from an elementary school. So that's that hits home right there. So thank you for all your hard work. First, Randy. Hey, first of all, I want to thank you for your efforts. I, you know, I've known you for a long time, including your mom teaching me in tenth grade. Um, been nothing but but professional. Question I have is: so we had this dealer, we'll just say close to a million dollars worth of drugs. Where did it come from? And who's going after the people that were supplying him to stop it from coming into our community? And I'm not saying that's on you or on us, but uh, no. And it, you know that's a fair question. You know, really, any 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 time we come across a um, you know a dealer of that stature move, moving that way, um, you know the first thing we, we do when, when we get him is debrief him. You know, find out how talkative they are. How forthcoming they want to be. Um, he, he was not. He um, didn't really feel like telling us where he got his kilo. Um, he, in, in his defense, uh, he, he's done he's done hard time several times. He's got um, he's okay. He can do it, and he's doing it right now. So uh, it, it, a, a lot of it depends on on their cooperation or lack thereof. Well, it was still it was still an awesome job. I was I always go back to the you know, the little fish to catch the big yeah. fish. Yeah. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much for coming here. It was very informative and I really appreciate it. What was unnerving to me was the ghost guns. Since then, have you encountered anybody else or anything in the area that has anything even similar to that in uh, this area? <coughs> no. Um and you know, like I had never seen a ghost gun before, before this. Um, I just saw in, I think it was the Daily News, um, NYPD just, just took down a case with um, a, a warehouse of ghost guns. Uh, they are, there's the fact that they're here is sobering. Um, what they can become is, is terrifying, Jeez. terrifying. And I mean, just not to, to really get, get off on a tangent about this, but um, there's, I mean, there's a very real possibility that ghost guns could change the, the conversation that is being had and has been had for years um, regarding gun control in this country. Um, uh, background checks, waiting lists, all of this, permits. Um, they make those arguments obsolete um, doesn't matter background check I all you need is a computer and the know-how and you saw what one guy was able to do on a farm and well you know um, but I, I'm not smart enough to figure that out so that's frightening thing. Th thanks for your efforts really yeah. appreciate it just like to thank you know um, for all your hard work you do here within the city and, and around the county um, and uh, just trying to uh, make it safer for uh, the residents here and just your you know your protective use of technology and all your efforts that's happening I'm just curious how did the gentleman in Fulton County able to afford to buy these type of materials around the world he's uh, he's buying pieces I mean that's all he, that's a he was a machinist by trade um, you know, he's, uh, he was working. I mean, he wasn't just uh, a guy in a little shed on, on his farm just putting these together. I mean, he had a business. He was, uh, he had money. And really, buying pieces of guns is a lot cheaper than buying a whole gun. You know, if you just need a little barrel like that, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks. You know? It just shows the depravity of both sides, you know, both the buyers oh. and the sellers. Uh, yeah. But uh, no question, no the question. future is in trouble. Thank you for your good work. Anyone else? Well, good. Well, just real quick, I don't. I don't think I can overstate um, the, the level of expertise, uh, the level of motivation uh, of our unit, and it's not a very big one. 
but as, as Chris said, uh, there's over 100 years of combined experience in that unit, um, and these guys are top notch. When we started this, the inception of the narcotics unit, it was never our intention to go after the user. We have always focused on the people that were bringing this stuff into our community, perpetuating it upon our youth, our community members, um, and we have always gone with the mindset that we didn't want to make this a business-friendly community for that particular trade, and I think we've been rather successful in, in doing that with such a small unit. So, uh, you know, my, my heart, heartfelt congratulations and thanks goes to Inspector Foster and, and his unit. They do one hell of a job for us over there. So thanks, Chris, appreciate it. Anything else? Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Inspector. With that, our second item will be a presentation by the Schenectady County Sheriff's Office of Street Crimes. And Inspector uh, Peter Forth is here with us tonight. Let's share the dais with the Sheriff. Uh, just a quick historical. Our street crimes unit's been in effect for nearly uh, four years now. Um, the, the last time we made a presentation, Inspector Strange was, was with us. He has since retired. Uh, Pete's been with us. Inspector Forth has been with us for two years now, Peter. And uh, we haven't missed a beat. Um, just a, a quick point. Uh, when, when Peter came on, we were focusing up on Crane Street. There was a lot of problems up there at the time. Pete came up with a game plan to address that. And at the time, Crane Street was a hot spot on, on our crime mapping, on our DDAX. And uh, it was, what, about an eight-month-long uh, venture there? Well, when that was done, they had been removed as a hot spot from, from that, uh, that mapping. And that was uh, some of the good work that Peter and his group had, had done. But I'm not going to speak any more about that. I'm going to let them share with you uh, some of the things they're doing there. And, and, and again, that there's another very professional, highly motivated unit under, under this gentleman. So, Peter, go on. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, thank you uh, for allowing me to come here and speak tonight. Uh, thank you for the support that you guys have given us so far. I believe I met with uh, some of you folks last year at our office. We came down for a site visit, um, took a tour of our office. We talked a little bit about some of the stuff we're doing then. Uh, last year, I wasn't able to do this. Um, so I reached out to Inspector Foster and asked him what to expect when to give this presentation. And after I see his, I can tell you he gave me bad information. I had videos for you of guys flying in like Superman and take care of stuff. He said, you don't need that, it's fine. Just go, go up there, share some numbers with him. About five minutes, everything's fine. And then I saw his presentation, so uh, I can tell you don't, uh, I don't have as much as uh, Chris was able to offer you, but I have some good numbers, uh, some of the good stuff that we are doing that I'll be happy to share with you. I'm gonna answer any questions that any way uh, may have. Uh, as the sheriff said, my name is Pete Forth. I'm the inspector of the street crimes unit. Uh, we have uh, 10 of us total in our unit. We have uh, two sergeants that work underneath me. Uh, one is from Schenectady PD. The other is a sheriff's uh, sergeant. Uh, we have six full-time TFOs, task force officers. Uh, one from the, an investigator from the district attorney's office. One deputy from the sheriff's office and four patrolmen from SPD. We have uh, liaisons from every department within the county uh, that unfortunately uh, we can't have full time, but we do work, uh, they do work with us part time or any issues that bring us into their jurisdictions. We will deal with uh, certain individuals from the different departments. Uh, we have some support services that work within our office. We have a full time investigator from social services that is assigned to our offices, as well as a full time New York Air National Guard um, uh, analyst who works in our office with us and a part-time um, analyst who works for the county who works in our office. Uh, the mission of the uh, Street Crime Task Force is to work side-by-side -side with any agency working within Schenectady County to reduce crime, conduct targeted enforcement in higher rising crime areas based on cri crime trends and statistics, provide manpower resources to any agency or task force working within Schenectady County 
on short or long-term investigations. Here's some of the agencies that we have worked with. This is just within the last year. This is 2021 alone. Um, uh, we worked with every federal agency that there are, uh, as well as most enforcement agencies within uh, New York State, like as you can see from tax and finance, uh, right up to uh, four, different, four or five different units from the state police. There's the local agencies, uh, excluding the, the agencies within our county, we work with them daily. These are all the other partnering agencies who we partner with in the area who we have assisted uh, or they have assisted us within the last 10 months of this year. Uh, we worked extensively, uh, we worked a lot with Saratoga County on a couple different incidents that they had going on. Uh, we worked uh, regularly, as I said, with the departments within our county. Um, so we have very, very good working relationships with most of the agencies in the area. Uh, a little bit about my staff, um, I should have mentioned before, we also bring a lot of experience to the table. Uh, we, we, with the exception of one individual in our unit, everyone on our unit has um, between 12 and 25 to 30 years of experience. So we bring a ton of experience to the table, which we are able to assist other people with. Um, our experience ranges from major crime investigators to crime scene investigators. Uh, we have a, a lot of very uh, uh, tactical folks on our unit, which are utilized a lot by other agencies in the area. Uh, we have a lot of trainers. Our guys work at the police academy and do a lot of teaching, so I can't emphasize enough the experience that the, the folks in my unit bring. Uh, here's our arrest. This is 2021. Our arrest year to date, the, the orange line are the number of arrests that we've made year to date. We're, I believe we're 255, or I think it's around 255 is the number. And there is our average, uh, our monthly arrest. We average probably around 30 arrests a month. Uh, you can see some of the areas, the, the, the low spots are where we've worked, like in January. We were still doing a lot of work, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, with COVID. We, we assisted a lot with COVID. We were doing a lot of work in January, so our arrests were down a lot. In August, we had assisted with a couple other agencies that had bigger cases. Uh, so our, our numbers go down in some certain spots, but we average uh, roughly 30, 30 arrests a month. Here's our field contacts with folks. Uh, we have, we're up to about 338 on a year. Uh, we get out and talk to a lot of people. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more why we're out there so much and some of the different things we do. Uh, but field contacts, just a little bit, I can tell you about field contacts go a long way in big investigations. Uh, so as, as Chris was explaining, some of those areas where people hang out and uh, for uh, illegal activity, we'll go up and interdict with people. Hi, how are you? What are you doing up here? Who are you hanging out with? What's going on? What can and what can't you do? Uh, who are you? And, and we'll record a lot of that information. Uh, those areas are high crime areas. That's why we're there. So inevitably, when a crime does happen there, they'll come back to us and say, who'd you talk to up there? We lay out those 300 and 40 field interview card and say we've talked to these people they're consistently there on these days these may be people of interest for what you folks may be looking for for these other crimes so uh, field contact reports uh, became really big probably 10 to 15 years ago um, of, of, of um, making sure to to keep this type of information that before was in someone else's notebook left in their pocket and in, in one person's head so now with a lot of the technology we're able to share uh, a lot of the, the people who we're dealing with, why we were dealing with um, in a, a bigger system for other folks to be able to look into or to, to help assist them on other investigations. Uh, the types of cases we regularly assist with, uh, everything you could think of, we we're, were called on to assist with. Uh, I spoke briefly before about uh, the COVID initiative. Last year, we worked very closely with the health department and helping uh, pro provide and identify locations for COVID testing, providing security at a lot of the COVID testing sites, um, and, uh, especially in the beginning when we weren't sure uh, how that was gonna go with, uh, is, were they gonna have any problems? So we were, we were uh, right from, from the ground up um, with helping plan that and then providing security right straight through. Uh, as I said, we, we worked numerous homicide investigations uh, in a majority of them in the city of Schenectady with providing a lot of intelligence for uh, what they needed for some of their cases or manpower, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, I'm also gonna, I'll, I'll touch briefly on uh, countywide overdose tracking, which we started uh, this year uh, to kind of be a clearinghouse for overdose tracking within the county. A majority of the, a lot of the overdoses, which we're seeing were in the city, 
but we're seeing just the recidivism of the same people, it, the same people it was happening in Rotterdam and Miskin and Scotia, or the same folks it was happening in the city. So we're, uh, we became a clearinghouse for uh, collecting data on overdoses throughout the county, which is still a work in progress, but we're, we're it, it's going a long way. Uh, so just a, a little bit about what we do in, in providing help in these cases. Um, what I like to say, and I tell our, our guys every time we meet them, we, we're, we do a lot of behind the scenes work. Uh, you won't see the Street Crimes Task Force name in the paper for, for making a lot of these arrests. Uh, you won't see, the, we, we don't get a lot of credit for uh, working homicides or, or doing hours and hours and hours of surveillance that other units don't have the time or the resources to do because we don't want to. We are perfectly happy doing behind the scenes work. We're perfectly happy being a force multiplier to any agency uh, that may need our help working within the county. Um, and, and we're very happy to do and provide the assistance that they often need. Uh, I've been in law enforcement uh, for almost 28, 29 years now. Um, and I can tell you when you need to help, you need it immediately. And that's what our unit is able to provide. Uh, when, when something happens and you know it's a weekend or a night, I can get on the phone with my folks uh, and get people out to, to add five or 10 bodies to any type of investigation or major incident going on anywhere in the county with a phone call. Uh, and that's, a, that, that's, that's what took us a little time to build that. Uh, I can tell you in law enforcement, as Chris stated also, especially in narcotics, it gets very competitive and, and folks are, this is, my, this is my own turf and we don't need help from anyone. We're actually at the point now, I can tell you within the last 48 hours, I was uh, three agencies within our county reached out to our team looking for assistance with, with all major crimes in three different jurisdictions within the county. Uh, so that is what we're doing. Like I said, you're not gonna see us a lot. You're not gonna see our names in the paper. We don't want our names in the paper. Um, the, a lot of the things we're doing, we're happy to do and, and, and hand deliver someone that someone may be looking for uh, or give the surveillance back or provide the identification on folks that may be involved in different incidents around the county, but that's what we're very happy to do. Um, just to, to talk about uh, a, a case that we had worked uh, we were contacted by the Scary County Sheriff's Department for uh, an overdose death that they had. And they were working with the state police uh, narcotics unit who tracked where this person bought the, the drugs that uh, they used uh, prior to their overdose to Rotterdam. They contacted us because we worked very closely with them and said, have you ever heard, the, uh, gave us a certain street name? We said, yes, we did. Uh, they said, would you work with us to help us identify additional people? We're trying to get back to this individual, get a drug case on this individual, hold them responsible for, for the overdose death uh, that we had in Scary County. Uh, through our, the work that we had done, the work very, worked very closely with the state police. This all, this all happened very quickly in a, in a couple other units. We identified the dealer. We uh, helped them execute a search warrant at a house within the city of Schenectady. Uh, we recovered three different handguns in this house, over $30,000 in cash, several ounces of cocaine, several ounce, ounces of heroin, and fentanyl used to mix. Um, and this, this whole thing transpired within a, a, probably about a 30 day period. Um, so being able to, to help other people continue their investigations within the county where had they gone to the city or had they gone to other places that are very, really, really busy with a lot of their own stuff. We have the flexibility to be able to stop doing what we're doing, move on to the task at hand that, that needs to be done immediately, put our resources into it, help them with what they need and move on to the next thing. As I advised the, the three folks that called us in the last three days, two of them uh, were for shooting and another two of them were for shootings and one was for um, car larcenies. They're having a, a, a terrible problem with uh, vehicles actually being stolen and items being stolen from a car. We are able to stop what we're doing, send our resources over. We have obviously the shootings, whatever, uh, take a little bit more precedence and offer additional uh, 10 person to, you know, we, we almost double, well, when we go and, and help out Scotia, which we often do, uh, we'll go over and we double the size of their police department within a day. So we could go over, we could supplement what they're doing with manpower, with a resource, uh, the, especially our folks that works in the, in the city, we bring a lot of experience uh, to these other places and are, are able to help on a lot of different levels. Um, so the, in, in a nutshell, that is what we do with a lot of these cases. 
I just wanted to show you a little bit about what we're doing with uh, countywide overdose tracking. Uh, so we have our, our Air National Guard analyst now handles this. We had two of our uh, members were, were tracking this up until recently when we received a new analyst from the Air National Guard. Um, and this is the, uh, of what we track. Uh, as you can see, the, the different lines, uh, uh, the, the, yellow, the yellow lines are the, the, the names that we add to a log. We, we created a log throughout the county of all the, the people that we have affirmatively identified uh, as overdosing. Um, and we, we carry a log so we can track what is happening to these folks. What, what we found, what you'll see on the bottom, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, of the um, over to all of the overdoses that we were able to track, um, over over 250 um, at this point that we were able to confirm were overdoses within the county. Uh, 29 people a total uh, overdosed a total of 67 times. What that tells us is we, we're able to predict who are going to be our fatalities um, in the future. Uh, what we saw, unfortunately, we, you know, we see the ups and downs of the fatal investigations. Uh, year to date from our investigation, we had 42 fatal uh, overdoses within the county, 42. Uh, we had 195 successful recoveries where they were able to use Narcan um, that we were able to track. And I can tell you, you'll see the asterisks by some of our numbers. We know our numbers are not completely accurate because there is a ton of issues in collecting this data that have to come with HIPAA. Uh, so when fire departments deal with folks, we don't get a lot of the reports. We have to dig into a lot of these. So we, we believe this is underreported, um, very underreported, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but this is, you, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, our analysts and our guys looked at 2,431 EMS calls for service within the county. We go through those every day and try to come up with the ones that either are overdoses or, or definitely confirmed as overdoses or maybe overdoses. Uh, so that we, we're, we stay pretty busy doing this. Uh, these are just some of the things we're doing. As I said, I think our biggest resource of what we're able to do is to be an instant force multiplier. We do not have a set, uh, we're not answering calls every day. We don't, we're, we're not, Chris is a very specialized narcotics unit. We work with narcotics units. We work with homicide units. We work with uh, gun units. We were able to work with everybody, gain the experience from them, or at the very least be a conduit to all the other agencies in the county to say, we may not be able to help you, but this person can. Give them a car or we'll, we'll, we'll give them a call for you. So that's pretty much what I have. Chris had a lot better pictures than I. Next year, uh, I'll be more prepared. Um, but if anyone has any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them the best I can. I'm just going to make a statement again, uh, which is I think when we um, first envisioned or first kind of concepted Street Crimes Task Force, it was about quality of life. It was about being impactful um, uh, from, a, from that theme of we're not open for business. If you're into, you know, crime, drugs, guns, whatever, in Schenectady County, we're closed for business in those, in those uh, disciplines. And so, you know, from a disruption, a, a uh, a dismantling, a disablement, right, of those activities, I would simply ask that same question that I asked Inspector, uh, which is, you know, what, what, how can we help, right? What tools, techniques, and training can we provide so that we're giving you the capacity to, to be that force multiplier and to activate uh, the, the actions that you need to take to improve quality of life? When I see those overdose numbers, you know, I, I'd like to understand what we're doing with those, but, but you know, how can we help you to improve um, uh, the, the activities? You guys are on track for like 350 arrests this year, so that seems substantial. Uh, I can answer that in two parts. First, with the overdoses, what we are hoping to get to, as I said, is we want to be a clearinghouse for overdoses. We would, uh, there, at this point, there's no tracking uh, as a county for everything that's happening. The city tracks, each individual municipality tracks, no one is tracking on a county level. We're trying to get that to the point where we'll track for everybody. What, this goes back to all the bosses at the beginning of the month to let them know trends that they have going on in, in different mun municipalities. We send that out to them. What we're hoping to do is also connect with uh, the health department, uh, connect with uh, places, the, uh, some of the services that are out there 
for the folks that we know, those, those 29 people that overdosed 67 times, to be able to say, uh, this individual, he's gonna be our next fatality, she's gonna be our next fatality, he, there needs to be some outreach. Uh, we, we've been working with Schenectady Cares, the program that the city has where they reach out to, to users and try to provide services to them. That we want, as I said, we wanted, want to be the conduit where we could pump that information out, uh, not only to law enforcement, uh, where we are, we're, we're giving information to Chris's unit, we're giving information to the city drug unit, to the DEA, to the, to the state police, what we're finding out, we're helping with investigations there, but we also wanna pump the, to, to help people, to, to bring what law enforcement does to a whole different level of being able to, to help a lot of the users that we have out there to break the cycle for them um, because we it's it's what we're doing now unfortunately isn't working um, I can tell you from my experience and the awesome job that Chris did with that case uh, you know we got him two more came up you know that, that are doing the same thing so we, we, we have to try different things this this is part of the level of trying different things working with different folks on different levels uh, to be to, to if we could take out the, the demand then then we'll keep working on the supply we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. And the second part of your question about what could you guys do for us, uh, I have to give the sheriff and the administration, they're awesome. I, anything that we go to them with to say, you know, we need this to for this, and whatever we already don't have, they're working really hard to get us. So uh, resources for us, I, I, I've said to them before, um, manpower is great, but it's tough for everybody right now. I know uh, most places can't can't get enough qualified folks to take the job. Um, and along those lines, when I started taking tests 30 years ago, there was 1,200 people in Schenectady County signed up to take the police test. The last list, I believe, has less than 100. So it is, it's, it's very difficult to, to find qualified people right now. If, if that was anything I think we can get, give us more folks, I'd like to put on, I'd put on another shift. I, I tell you, we have plenty of work uh, to keep everybody busy. No, no one sits around much in our office. Uh, uh, folks are busy every day, all day. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing that we could ask for. It's a, it's a question, not a comment, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think one of the, this is, this, both of these are really gratifying presentations and I'll tell you why. Uh, part of the history here, as you all know, uh, came out of data, this was a, really data-driven effort. A number of our members were becoming distressed at the state data that we were seeing, data, data, whichever, uh, and saying, can this be right? We're, so, we're, we're an outlier, what's, what's happening here? And, and you know, uh, full credit to our chair, um, it took some serious time and analyzed those and put on his retired police chief cap and uh, came back to us and said, no, this is, there's nothing wrong with this data, this is real. Uh, and that led us to, well, what can we as a county in partnership, full partnership with our sheriff uh, do to try to, to move this data in another direction? And the reason these uh, presentations were so encouraging tonight is um, after a few years, sometimes the mission moves a little here or there, and it's, it's very gratifying to me that we're still on, we're still focused on that mission, uh, both on the, on the narcotics and drug side and on the street crime side, this is exactly the kind of work that um, that I hoped um, both those units would do, and exactly the kind of work that I am convinced my colleagues would be more than willing to continue to fund and support. And when we get into the budget tonight, we'll we'll have an opportunity to to look through that as well. So just thank you for coming. Thanks for the focus. Uh, you do have a true partnership here uh, between the sheriff's department and this county legislature, and, and I, I'm convinced we're getting results. Thanks, Gary. Uh, before before we close, I'd just like to introduce our under sheriff Jim Barrett, who's pretty much responsible for the day to day operations for all these units and managing the heads of those uh, units. And uh, we try to be as supportive as we possibly can be to uh, to all our. Uh, law enforcement units as well as our other units within within the sheriff's office and also we have lieutenant Jirasi in the back who is our patrol division commander and he does one heck of a job for us as well 
Um, again, can't overstate to you the quality of individuals that we have here that work uh, for your sheriff's office, ultimately for the county of Schenectady and their residents. Um, I'm rather proud of it. I've been here 12 years, and I think we've put together one hell of a team. Uh, uh, if you look at the, the gun violence uh, and, and, and the shootings and the homicides, we're, we're running a distant third to, to Albany and Troy, and there's a reason for that. It's a culmination of these units doing the things that they're doing, the city police department doing the fine job that they do, the gang intervention programs. So there's there's a working um, partnership uh, that, that I have never seen in, in my time, my 33 years in law enforcement at this particular level. Um, so, so you folks can be rather proud of the job these guys are doing uh, for you and uh, w they will continue to do that job. They're only gonna get better. So with that, Peter, uh, thank you again. Uh, done a great job for us and as expected and, and I would expect that you're gonna continue to do some great work for us. Thank you. Um, and thank you guys very much for, for having us here tonight and presenting. One final item up tonight is, uh, one sec. PSF 11, resolution regarding the acceptance of monies from the New York State Department of Labor to support workforce development in Schenectady County. And with us tonight is Jennifer Bargy, Director of Workforce Development to explain and answer any questions you may have. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am here on behalf of the New York State Department of Labor to receive money uh, in, um, in regard to the gun violence prevention initiative. Uh, if you can recall, I've been here two other times for two other state agencies for the same initiative. This funding specifically uh, targets youth between the ages of 18 and 24, and it provides $300,000 to Schenectady County with the goal of being getting 60 youth uh, integrated into the workforce. Um, our goal will be much more holistic than that, supporting them to return back to school, supporting them um, to obtain mental health, drug alcohol, whatever uh, assistance that they need and supportive services that they need um, to safely re reintegrate into the community and into the services that we have to offer. Uh, I respectfully would request authorization to accept the $300,000 from New York State Department of Labor um, and amend the 2021 budget for $75,000 uh, with a secondary amendment for the remaining money to the 2022 budget. Thank you. Are there any questions for the director? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The Thank you. resolution's been moved to the floor. Thank you. We'll close public safety and firefighting for the evening. Thank you, sir. Our next committee is the Committee on Technology and Communications and Chairman Lucita Russo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll call to order the Committee on Technology and Communications. We have one uh, item on the agenda tonight. Uh, Technology 12, a resolution to amend the 2021 Capital Improvement Program to provide funding for the implementation of a multi-factor authentication system for certain county employees. We have our CIO, Jeff Brunt, with us to uh, give us an explanation on this um, surplus appropriation. Mr. Brunt. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so in continuing Schenectady County cybersecurity efforts, um, we want to implement multi-factor authentication to all users and employees throughout the county. Um, it allows, it requires a user to provide two or more verification um, factors besides just a password. So uh, users will be issued either a, a token that looks like this, or um, there's a phone app that can be installed on a phone. So um, either way, it will require a uh, code 
um, for you to enter um, to gain access to a resource. So we're looking to start this project now um, instead of waiting till 2022 due to the supply chain problems um, that, that everybody's encountering. Um, back orders for computer equipment is now 90 days to 120 days out. Um, we need to have this implemented before our renewal of our cybersecurity insurance, which is on May 2022. So we have about 900 employees to implement this on. So that's gonna be quite the task uh, for, uh, for my department to, uh, to do throughout the county. So we're asking for a, um, a budget amendment for 2021 for $56,000 to get this project on the way. Any questions? Any questions? Move to report. Second. And second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. The motion is moved. Thank you, Mr. Brunt. Thank you. And with that, I'll uh, close the Committee on Technology and Communications, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. The last committee meeting of the evening is the Committee on Ways and Means to be chaired by Legislator Fields. Chair, the Committee on Ways and Means will now come to order. We have, we'll go a little out of order this evening and just start off with um, the items starting from TC12, which we have heard in various committees. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hughes. Is, uh, is my customary motion to move all of the calendars save for Ways and Means presentation by the county manager to move that in its entirety? Is that in order at this time? Half by a motion by Mr. Hughes to move the entire agenda from TC12 on. We have second, Mr. McDonald. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The entire agenda, except for the presentation, has been moved. Thank you very much. So, with that, um, this evening we will have a presentation by the county manager on the 2022 uh, county budget. Staff will be joining you also. Staff are always welcome to join. It's good to have a nice concert up here. <laughs> I think they're waiting for me to get started. Go ahead, you can get started when you're ready. <laughs> you're fine. Uh, well, thank you everybody for uh, hearing me out and, and listening to uh, 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 my presentation tonight. Hopefully everybody was able to, to take a look at uh, our document. Um, just quickly, uh, a couple of changes about the physical document itself. Uh, we realized pretty quickly this year, because there's always a, a time crunch, a time frame to, to be able to assimilate all this information and get it into one document. Um, there's always about a four, five, six day uh, lag where we've got to get it to the printer and get it back. Uh, and lo and behold, we have our own print shop but down at Board of Elections, so they were uh, wonderful. They can, they can do these documents uh, 300 pages, uh, 30 copies in 30 minutes. It was truly a wonderful thing. Uh, hopefully the binding holds up, uh, mine has, um, and it's just a great resource that we have down on our Board of Elections uh, to be able to bind these physical documents. What's that? Well, well, we do have a digital copy, and I believe that you have one. Uh, it's, it's about choice, I would like to think, so. Um, beyond that, um, you know, uh, at some point we would like to submit this physical document document to GASB, which is a government accounting uh, board for uh, how budgets are presented uh, and accommodation to uh, how the public can read it, uh, easy to use. So we've added some uh, user guides, glossary. Um, in the years to come, we're gonna be adding more charts and documents. Um, the document itself uh, is, is moving along and progressing as we move away from IFM to MUNIS. Um, uh, it's going to be easier to move tables and move additions and subtractions of the things that we have now. I know it, it's kind of a hard concept. You think, oh, you just put things on spreadsheets and things can move from A to B. Uh, we have a very outdated uh, um, um, financial software structure uh, in this county um, as of the last day of September. Uh, on the last page of this document, there's some pictures, but a very nice kind of ceremony in finance uh, where we had a switch and a light and we moved from our old IFM system uh, to our new Munis system. So 
as of uh, the last month of this year and next year, will actually be on a productive, easy to use financial system that most other large uh, uh, entities have. So we're all looking forward to that. Some of those are some of the kind of the boring details, but um, we'll get started. So uh, on the front cover, uh, we just some good representative pictures of some of the highlights of things that have happened this year. Uh, up top is the Begley Learning Center grand opening, Dr. Steady Muno, uh, transformative uh, change to our library and where people can come and study uh, at our community college, uh, all with support from this legislature. Uh, we have some pictures of some nurses at one of our uh, mass pod clinics from Rivers Casino. Uh, bottom right hand corner is our senior long term care picnic. Uh, that is Bill Frank with a veteran. Uh, who runs our, our veterans uh, um, um, program here within the county. And then bottom left is uh, one of our, our county clerk's uh, naturalization ceremonies uh, that occurred this summer. This year, you know, we have good news. Um, we've had uh, a very interesting year as far as, what am I doing here? There we go. <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, last year the world changed on March 13th with, with COVID happening. Uh, a year ago today, we didn't know where we were financially. We did not uh, appreciate or understand what state and federal uh, monies that were gonna be coming into the county. Um, so last year we had to budget at a place where uh, I came to you and asked for a 1.95 uh, uh, tax increase, which is something very different than this body normally does. Uh, in the past six years, the average uh, sales tax levy has been 0%, so I'll say that again over the past six years, including last year's plus 1.95, we averaged a 0%. This negative 1% property tax decrease that I'm uh, offering today will, will get us to that 0% over uh, the previous six years. Um, quickly, within every year since 2017, us not uh, asking for, for the maximum amount that we can ask for to property tax owners. Uh, we leave some quote, some money on the table. If you go back and add up how much money we actually could go out to the public and tax them, it's been over $30 million over the past six years. So that's $30 million less that we're taking from the public on our property tax levy. So that's a very impressive um, statistic. Here is just our chart. Obviously, uh, every year, uh, we go through our uh, uh, process of trying to figure out how much we need. Uh, all appropriations county-wise is 342 million. Obviously, we have other revenues coming in to, to take, uh, uh, to go against that. Sales tax, mortgage recording tax, state and federal uh, grants to, to run our mandated programs. And what's left over is, is, is the one thing that we have control of, and that's the, the property tax levy. Um, in the state of New York, uh, we have a 2% tax cap, meaning uh, by law, we cannot ask for more than 2% unless this body allows us to override that. Uh, and this chart is just a representation of uh, where we could have legally taxed uh, our residents. And again, that's that $30 million difference compounded uh, if you go back to 2017 till now. Some, obviously some, some budget influences um, in the county. Technically, we are still under a state of emergency. Um, so with that, you know, it gives us opportunities to uh, be reimbursed by FEMA, to continue to receive uh, state and federal funds as far as all of our COVID-related uh, budgetary issues, uh, which we'll be talking a little bit more. Um, obviously, this body uh, and managers, finance, everybody uh, in the building wants to minimize the impact of state mandates on property taxpayers. You know, uh, county government is the true pivot point for providing uh, services to citizens by law from the state of New York, meaning the state of New York comes through and says, you will pre perform services A, B, and C. So many of our mandated services, we don't have a choice, we have to offer them to our citizens. Infrastructure investment. That was a major driver this year. You know, last year when we really kind of uh, did a fire sale with our budget and we really tried to cut back as much as we could. Fortunately, our capital investments in our buildings, our equipment, and our infrastructure uh, was reduced last year. So this year, uh, we're doing over $20 million in capital on the purpose of we didn't do as much as we should have last year because of the economic situation we were in, uh, and it's the right thing to do. If, if we have the revenues coming in, it's, it just makes sound, prudent sense to progressively go after your buildings, fix them up, 
make sure that our people have right equipment. You know, other things uh, that we try and do around here that's representative, that gets noticed from outside agencies, you know, again, uh, we just found this out 10 days ago. Uh, we received, again, our, our, our capital A1 bond rating from Moody's. Uh, it's a process of application every year. Uh, Ray Gillen's involved, uh, uh, John McPhillips, head of finance is involved, I get involved. And it's just an interview and a review of all of our uh, financials. Uh, and again, Moody's determined that, that uh, there's only six of us counties in the state that have this rating, and we've been there for quite some time now. So we have maintained that AA1 bond rating. Uh, the Comptroller's Office last year, uh, we did uh, receive the no uh, physical stress, but because of COVID, uh, there was an indicator that possibly there was an environmental stress. Uh, the comptroller's rates how a governmental economy is doing on the physical side and the environmental side. Um, but this year, even despite COVID, we have the designated no physical or environmental stress. Uh, and I put highest vaccination numbers in the state. You know, for the longest time, uh, we were number one uh, with our vaccination rate of adults in this state. Uh, we've slipped down to about two or three now at this point. Um, but vaccination completely ties into economics. You know, people aren't gonna wanna leave their house and go spend money uh, if they don't feel safe. And how do you do that? You know, initially in the pandemic, it was test, trace, and isolate. And the minute our county had the ability to vaccinate as well, we hit it hard and we hit it strong and our vaccination numbers are higher in the state. And that's proven by how much sales tax revenue is coming in. So, on our property tax levy, what, what does that mean for your constituents? What does that mean for uh, property tax owners? Uh, you know, truly county uh, property tax is only about 21 cents out of the average dollar that is paid uh, by the property owner. You know, 79 cents continues to be paid uh, mostly by the school district. Other fire, other districts are involved in that. And even our 21 cents, most of that is, is for mandated programs, Medicaid, other mandated programs. Again, we always say this a lot, you know, if we didn't have Medicaid, we might not even have to have a property tax. So that, that's a significant statement. Other mandated costs, you know, it's something that each year normally we, we talk about more sternly. It seems like with COVID, we've gotten away from actually talking about these things, but all these are huge drivers for our budget. Medicaid, TANF, Safety Net, that's our Department of Social Services, Child Welfare, uh, community college chargebacks, every moment where a citizen of Schenectady goes to a different county, to a community college, children with special needs, early intervention, preschool education, uh, indigent legal defense, every single citizen has the right to counsel, uh, the county pays for that with state funding, probation, uh, JD pins, youth detention, youth detention costs uh, only continue to rise, uh, foster care, and of course public health. We have many layers of good news in this budget. You know, one of the drivers for why uh, we could do the negative 1% uh, property tax levy, uh, some larger economic trends have been happening. Stock market has been going up, uh, and we've had some employees retire. Last year, this body authorized uh, an early retirement, uh, and every time a person with a longer years of service retires from a lower tier in the pension system, uh, it's less expensive for us to pay into the system. So the uh, DiNapoli and the Comptroller's Office uh, gave all municipalities good news this year uh, that our contributions have decreased. Here in Schenectady County, it was, uh, it was about 20, uh, ooh, I'm gonna forget the percent, but it was $2.7 million less that we had to write a check to the Comptroller's Office for all our retirees. So that was very good news for us. This year, uh, thank you to uh, our, our negotiating team headed by uh, Mr. Gardner. Um, we've settled some labor contracts. Uh, we made some early tactical decisions. Uh, the A, one, we wanted to settle contracts with our, our workers, our, our, our unionized workforce. Uh, and two, we wanted a long-term deal. We wanted a five-year deal. Obviously, there are some things rumbling in the economy. You know, I don't like to use the, the, the inflation word. Mr. Gardner and I have conversations about that all the time. I like to say things like consumer price index is going up or kinks in, in our <laughs> uh, supply chains are, are driving up prices. Um, but the facts are it was a good thing for us to lock in for five years, uh, and we did. Um, you know, we had a rate increase uh, in uh, for our wages uh, for 2021, 2%, uh, and then every year from 2022 to 25, 
uh, we're increasing it at 2.25%. That's for CSCA and 1199 folks. Um, this five-year lock just gives us stability so that we know our costs going up from year to year. And it's and frankly, it's, it's comparable to other labor contracts in the area. So this isn't, you know, for years and years, you know, we rode closer to the 1% number um, because we could, that was our economic state. Uh, but this is more reflective to uh, not only the hard year that our labor has gone through, uh, but what we can provide them uh, in a cost-effective and responsible manner. Uh, and the last thing we have there, uh, one of our uh, things we put into our labor contracts this year uh, was paid family leave. You know, we have uh, a problem uh, with sometimes losing, you know, that, that young adult that has the emerging family and is really uh, starting a family and maybe chooses not to work or uh, a spouse goes to work for uh, higher income and private sector. Um, so we have that spot where we lose good employees two, three, six years in. Um, so paid family leave, every employee here in county government has the right to FMLA, but that's only to hold your job. So say if a, uh, a female has a baby or uh, a husband of, of somebody who has uh, a baby wants to take time off from their work, they can by law here in Schenectady County for 12 weeks, but that's FMLA, that's unpaid. So you can take your accruals, but you're not getting paid. We put into our contracts a paid family leave for eight weeks, two thirds pay, maxing at a thousand a week to do the right thing, go bond, be with your newly born, whether it's uh, your own child, an adopted child, a foster child, we believe this is gonna help us retain uh, that younger age employee. One of the things that uh, I really tried to stress uh, uh, when I became manager is I'm not doing this alone. I have a lot of uh, managers that I need to lean on as far as uh, managing 1,300 people. Uh, so one of the things I'd like to start to do uh, annually is just kind of reflect on the new management faces here. Uh, these are folks that uh, in 2021 are close to previous that have taken on managerial roles. Uh, we have Arthur Butler, head of uh, uh, Human uh, Rights Commission. He's been a wonderful adjunct to our uh, HR department, EAP. Anytime we have human rights uh, uh, conditions or issues with our employees themselves, he's been a wonderful person to be able to dispatch uh, to assist and help. We have Steve Luciano, uh, new head of uh, facilities department comes to us uh, from the business and construction trades and has a really good handle on, on moving projects uh, at a nice rate. We have uh, Mr. Charlie Davidson in the manager's office, our new sustainability coordinator. Uh, it's been a tremendous help uh, to Jackie and myself as far as uh, dealing with department heads and, and, and ongoing management. Joanne DeCerebo, longtime employee, uh, but last year we talked her into taking a management role uh, which she uh, uh, did and did willingly. She's been a wonderful EAP manager to be able to dispatch uh, when employees are having problems, help them bridge into our platform of videos um, for our pro you know, when people have problems at work. Um, Todd Zbitniewski comes to us with uh, 20 years experience. He's our new nursing home administrator. Uh, um, really came to us at a transitional time at our nursing home, uh, obviously with COVID ongoing uh, opening and closing of allowing families in the building, uh, our recent uh, vaccine mandate, which I'll, I'll say quickly, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of our employees out there that chose to do the right thing. Uh, the last week of September, under direction of the state health department, all uh, hospitals and nursing homes had the requirement of if you want to work there, you need to be vaccinated. Uh, you know, we had 267 employees uh, and contractors and volunteers that come in and out of our building. Uh, and out of 267, only four, only four folks were actually displaced from our nursing home uh, because of the uh, um, uh, declining to take the vaccine. So that's good work from Todd Zabitniewski about talking one-to-one -one with people uh, on his management team. Obviously, everybody knows Jesse McGuire doing great work down the county clerk's office and then over at Public Health uh, Keith Brown and Claire Profit, kind of new management faces, folks that are certainly helping me help uh, manage the county. So more about vaccination efforts, because again, uh, this is driving physical policy in the county. Um, you know, we average in the months of uh, September and October, 23 pods a week, 23 separate points of dispensing a week in this county. Um, we're still very aggressively uh, pushing uh, 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 the vaccine itself, whether it's uh, for the initial dose, booster dose, third doses, uh, we are continuing to push that 
uh, to folks uh, in our county. Uh, 453 people to date have been had uh, vaccinated at home. Um, so that's a wonderful home delivery program of a vaccine. If anybody has limitations of transportation or equity or time because they're working too much, we'll come to you. And that amazing number, 31,000 doses have been administered by Schenectady County uh, since literally uh, uh, January 1st of this year. So that's a tremendous number. Again, it's just an, uh, a testament to how hard our public health is working on uh, our school-based pods. Every single public school district in this county has hosted us as a pod. The minute we went from uh, able to vaccinate uh, 12 to 17 year olds, we got right into the schools. Uh, we were able to host these pods. We're already geared up, ready to go within 24, 48 hours of when we're allowed to vaccinate uh, the five to 12 year olds, we're just gonna play it back. We're gonna get into the schools quickly uh, and vaccinate um, kids uh, with parents who want their kids vaccinated. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, just quickly to talk, just wanted to talk about some highlights from, from our uh, departments. Um, we had a great presentation from the sheriff's team today. I wanna thank him, he's still sitting in the back. Thank you, sir. We're gonna we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the changes in the sheriff's budget that I'm recommending to you folks tonight. Um, Department of Social Services, you know, uh, um, it, it's been an interesting time in social services because when COVID first hit, uh, things bottom out a little bit. Things are slowly kind of getting busier down there. Um, but even when I say slowly busier, you know, we touch, you know, 180 uh, transactions alone in temporary assistance, Medicaid, SNAP, and HEAP. 180,000, that, that, that is a tremendous number. I know we have 200 people that work down there, uh, but even when they're not busy, they're busy, if that makes sense. Um, we manage a caseload of, of over 14,000 folks with Medicaid and over 21,000 folks alone with SNAP benefits. Uh, children and Family Services, we adopted, uh, facilitated the adoption of uh, 20 children in 2021. Uh, we're at a little bit higher pace uh, this year for 2021, but in 2020, uh, we facilitated the adoption of 20 children, and that was peak pandemic time. Uh, 866 children were subsidized in childcare alone. Uh, we're always working to improve that number. We always seem to have a little bit of extra money in that line every year, uh, but we're always working with different strategies to, to maximize uh, the number of children that are subsidized in childcare. 216 kids uh, in 2021, year to date, uh, in foster care. The average number of children in, uh, in foster homes continues to decline. There's been a, about a five year decline there. Um, so that's actually good news. Uh, and 2022 will be our first year of operational uh, family first legislation. That was uh, a federally inspired uh, state law now. Uh, it, it just, it, it, there's a lot of integration that has to occur now in our children welfare system. So family first, uh, it's, it's almost an overlay of how the state wants us to apply foster care uh, through more of a kinsmanship model. So meeting if there is a, a child that's displaced, whether it's drug or alcohol or whatever the reasons why that the child enters foster care system, um, to not only just go to your bank of foster parents, but to also start interviewing family members. Is there a cousin? Is there a grandfather? Is there somebody that we can fast track uh, on a uh, foster training program to make this child safe in a more uh, uh, familiar environment? It's, it's, it's really a wonderful, a smart state policy uh, in 2020, we're fully gonna be able to integrate that. So certified messengers, uh, having those children in familiar homes decreases the trauma. Um, public works, uh, we've been very stable out at Public Works. Uh, you know, again, our rating for, for roads is a 3.12 over five. Average in the state is a little under three, so we are above average. We had zero uh, defective road claims in 2020, which is always a good thing. The state came through our road system, evaluated us, and said we didn't have any defective claims. Uh, we do about 67 miles of preventive maintenance and about 20 uh, miles of new roads from 2020, and we're on pace to do that again in 2021. Uh, I mentioned our public defender, you know, again, uh, our public defender, conflict defender, uh, uh, um, 18Bs, which are the, the, the other lawyers that, that will defend folks in courts. 
Um, we continue to be busy. They handle the 807 new felony cases alone, 2,762 misdemeanor violation cases, over 1,000 new family court cases, and, that, and this is a time of COVID when things have slowed a little bit. So our defenders have remained uh, uh, busy. They are, uh, again, a right to a defense in this state, uh, comes managed by the county. We do receive state funding for this. Uh, you might hear the words for Al Harraring, uh, which is uh, basically uh, the reason why we need to hire uh, more public defenders and conflict defenders so they can reduce caseload. Uh, very important to reduce caseload so that our folks are not overworked. Our library system, uh, you know, we're continuing to get back on track with our library system. The 2022 budget fully uh, 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 supports and financially readies our library system to be at pre-pandemic levels 100%. Um, you know, this body this year added three positions. We did take out a couple positions um, in the 2020 budget, so we started to repair that this year. And then uh, uh, in the budget, when we get to it, we added a new library in three. We were able to move some positions around uh, to get some more clerks in there. We do have, uh, um, just like every other entity, uh, uh, we are having some trouble hiring some clerks. If anybody uh, knows somebody that wants to be employed as a library clerk, please contact our uh, HR department and Joe McQueen. You know, over 2022, uh, uh, we're at 12% over last year. Truly the better indicator is we're about 7% over uh, our 2020 budget. I mentioned consumer affairs, weights and measures. Uh, this is a small but mighty. <laughs> I remember I mentioned this last year because it's, it's two people. They bring in close to a million dollars in revenues for our county. Um, during the pandemic, they didn't miss a beat. They just ended up working from home, uh, still getting out and protecting consumer rights. It's not only about the revenue, um, but if there's something wrong, a gallon of gas is not a gallon, it's 0.9, or your, your bag of rolls uh, isn't what you paid for. These are the people that, that are protecting our consumers and they do a great job. So one of the uh, drivers or influences of this budget um, is certainly is capital, infrastructure, and, and equipment purchases. Uh, across all departments, I, I really tried to challenge some of our department heads. You know, listen, I know we shorted you last year. Um, you know, our revenues are returning to a place where not only can we go back from last year and purchase things that maybe we should have purchased last year, but what, what can we do for the next decade here? What, 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 where should we be with equipment? Where should we be with fixing our buildings uh, and the like? So um, our list of capital investments will, will be a good discussion, but just briefly some highlights. You know, we're continuing to work forward uh, modernizing SCCC. You know, we talked about uh, the Begley Center and what a tremendous success that is. Uh, there's an envisionment of trying to consolidate our student services into one place. Um, with that, uh, uh, their five-year um, capital plan is going to be up, so I am um, suggesting that we go down the road of, of starting a new five-year capital plan. That was something that was engineered from an outside uh, company, and we can talk more about that when we get into capital. There are some safety issues. Um, our campus-wide fire alarm system out there uh, uh, they have a, believe it or not, their fire system uh, in, the, uh, um, in their auditorium isn't appropriate, so that needs to be replaced. Uh, the phones, some of those safety phones that are out in the parking lots for students walking out late at night, uh, the, the lines are not starting to work, so they're not 100%, so we need to get in there and we need to fix those. Lecture hall and classroom technology upgrades, you know, we have a couple of rooms that still have VCRs. <laughs> they gotta go, we need smart boards, we need, we need, we need some upgrades for sure. Um, some venting uh, in the kitchen. Uh, some of the vents are, are 20 years old, not appropriately moving air safely, so we need to move on those. Uh, you heard me mention earlier uh, um, about some of the marble that's falling off. Our courthouse next door, uh, not only some of the marble falling off, but we've got a couple columns in the basement that need to be fixed. Uh, it's a very old building. Uh, it's, it's time to fix some of the uh, basement infrastructure for sure. We're definitely paying some attention to our county library system, uh, HVAC and ventilation improvements, uh, the Karen B. Johnson, Rotterdam, Quaker, Miskino libraries. Some of that line, uh, we've applied for uh, over a million dollars in CDBG money. Uh, for some of those libraries, we might be able to pay for that with, 
with the CDBG money, um, DMV expansion. We're finally gonna this year get to uh, expanding out into that part of the DMV that has had the construction paper out front. It's time to uh, expand a little bit down at our DMV, uh, and I can get into that uh, when we go over the county clerk's budget. Um, and first floor at 797, uh, again, we need to redo the HVAC. Um, prior to the pandemic, we started to have too many people at once coming in there, and uh, the air movement wasn't just right, so we need to upgrade the HVAC and the ventilation out there. Just on the first floor, that's where our consumers come in and interact with the first layer of Department of Social Service workers. Uh, engineering and public works, you know, we're still committed to our county highway improvements. Uh, we have a fuel tank that's underground uh, out at uh, um, highway that needs to be replaced. We started to put money aside last year for it. It wasn't enough, so I'm coming back and asking uh, for more money to, to make sure that we replace it. It is at the end of its user's life. Uh, it needs to be dug up, it needs to, to be removed. Um, and then because of uh, the, the change in the movement uh, and our records management uh, out at Keller Ave, this is our dry storage, it's our storage for all of our court documents, county clerk documents, anything the DA has uh, for prosecution gets stored out there. Um, we are literally out of space. So last year, uh, we were, this body approved an, an expansion of records management. So we're building out, that building is happening now, but it's literally removing a wall into where our snow plows are currently parked. And so we can kind of manage them around and move them around a little bit. Um, but Public Works needs another building. We need to make sure these snow plows are safe. We need to make sure they're appropriately covered so they're not outside. And there's some other uh, pieces of equipment that really shouldn't be left outside. You shouldn't leave a plow outside overnight. You shouldn't leave anything mechanical outside uh, overnight in the winter months. So uh, we're committing to protecting our investments and creating uh, a building for that. Information and technology and system improvements. Um, this, is, this is a place where I'm, I'm excited to, to add money into the budget. You know, uh, for years, you know, we would uh, try and get things done on the cheap appropriately because we always weren't in a position that we are now. Uh, you know, I think one of the first actions of me becoming county manager was our old email system, uh, the Zimbra system. It was just, it was awful. And it was one thing that people asked me to do was please get us off Zimbra, please get us onto Microsoft. Uh, so we did that, and every year I keep asking those, those questions. What, what more can we do to make sure we're technologically safe? Obviously in 2019, uh, you know, we had the attack, we quickly fixed it. From that, we had an outside contractor give us a pretty good checklist on how we can continue to evolve uh, as a computer information department. Some things we need to do uh, is replace our countywide switches. That is the, the mechanism of when the information comes in, whether it's on fiber or phone or or cable, uh, there, there's a switch that sits there before it goes into storage, whether it's hard storage, cloud storage, on your computer storage. Most of our switches are 20 years old. When we uh, redid the UCC switch, the switch alone was a was a million dollars, but we were able to partner with, with Albany County, so we only had to spend that half as much. That's a very redundant, uh, police-heavy, um, more expensive switch. So these switches that we're talking about, there's multiple ones, um, but it is an investment that I'm asking this body uh, to, to make. Um, uh, our head of information services talked about multi-factor authentication. Authentication. Um, that's that's just needed. We're going to drop our our uh, um, our rider for our cybersecurity insurance if we don't make that happen. So there was a partial ask for this year, so we could get it started early and then to finish it out next year. Um, we have our computer and server replacements uh, upgrades, uh, and then of course we have some county office building security camera upgrades. We had a, uh, um, twice in the past two months, we've had the bomb squad here because of just uh, somebody you know out front left a bag and nobody was sure what it was, looked very suspicious. Um, and I say bomb squad, uh, you know, I'm probably using the wrong term, but I think <laughs> Dom's back there laughing at me. But the one time they, they happened to be close by, the normal response, uh, you know, of course, our sheriff's department, uh, local police, um, but anything suspicious, you know, we can't be too, you know, we can't be too easy on uh, investigating the threat. So 
Uh, the one thing we certainly don't have is a camera. We have cameras in this building. We don't have a camera in the front of our building that's showing the front door or anything out front or our side door off either. Um, so it's, it's time to put in a few more cameras around this building. Um, and there's also a camera upgrade for, for the jail next door too. And we'll talk more about that when we get talking about the jail. Uh, aviation. So we have uh, taxiway E, F, K construction for, for lighting and signage. You know, the runway is where the planes take off and land. The taxiways are kind of where they, they go back and forth. Um, taxiway A and B design. Uh, and we we'll also need a sand, sedge store, sand storage shed out there. Um, Sheriff's Department uh, down at the bottom. Uh, this body has committed, you know, starting when, when I was on the ledge of uh, moving uh, budgetarily the, uh, um, the substation from the jail out to Princetown. We purchased that building a few years back. We've slowly been making renovations to it. Uh, we wanted to move some of the uh, dog training uh, and dog uh, holding areas out to a, a building out back. Um, as in 2019, 2020, when we start going out for, for costs uh, to, to figure out putting in a, a lock room down in the basement because there is no place to change or get dressed if something happens on the job. Um, costs came in high, and so I'm coming back asking for uh, uh, some more investment in the substation out the Sheriff's Department. We're actually looking to, to build another building out back where we can have those lock rooms, storage uh, for our sheriffs, uh, and also uh, services for the dogs. We're also looking uh, to renovate the civil affairs office in the correctional facility. Uh, our folks uh, who worked for the sheriff's department patrol that um, uh, when um, it's time to uh, be evicted, it's a whole court process. Uh, but at the end of the day, at some point, if a judge has signed an eviction order, there's a process involved. And so that involves our sheriff's department, it involves a sheriff, one or two of those folks going out and serving notice, you know, making sure that there's no uh, problem or drama that happens. I know just not too long ago, maybe it was, I think two years ago, there was, there was a serious uh, gun issue because, you know, when you serve that eviction, it's, it's a very stressful moment in somebody's life. Um, so it's, it's um, the physical place where they're housed is, is due an upgrade. So I'm asking uh, to, to renovate the civil affairs office in the correctional facility the sally port in the back. A sally port is a controlled exit and entry into a secure place. Um, so it could be a revolving door. At our sheriff's uh, um, jail, it's the large um, chain link fence that moves back and forth so that, so that people can drive in. And it's also the entrance way. There's a lot of rust on some of the bottom of the doors. You never want to have that thing break moving uh, because a sally port, it's, it's about safety of entering and exiting so that only the people that, that enter the sally on the one lock side are still there so that when the other door opens, that's the person moves through, that there's been a safe transference to a non-secure area to a secure area. So it's very important and it's time to uh, redo it. Uh, jail roof, door replacement, LED lighting upgrade. We're also asking for three more vehicles. talking about the actual budget document itself um, so I feel I don't have to talk too much about that again we're going for submission at some point you know this year's budget you'll see uh, you know like it was almost like IFM made its last gasp you know of, of making the budget not look so great towards the end some of our budget numbers are within grid like graphs which should not be there um, but we had to make the choice to print because uh, again, to move some of these numbers around in the IFM system is, is really not so great. Brings me to the end. Uh, top left corner picture, we did a bit of a ceremonial uh, um, hand switch with a light bulb. The infamous George Kirker set that up for us. It was really for the finance staff who worked so hard uh, in the transition from IFM to Munis. Um, top right hand corner, it's some uh, um, electric charging stations that we're starting to put in throughout the county. Uh, we've put in 12 down at Department of Social Services. Every year we're slowly gonna start adding some electric cars to our fleet. Uh, we also have a project where every library in our library system will have an electric charger. Um, so that's happening this year. Uh, bottom left, of course, dignitary, uh, Senator uh, Gilbrand. And bottom right was a uh, volunteer 
uh, picnic for some of our volunteers uh, at our pods. You know, we had over uh, 50, 60 volunteers regularly that would come to our pod, especially our big ones. And at some point, we felt that we had to do something for them because we had people putting in, you know, 20, 25 hours a week volunteering for us to uh, make sure that our pods could happen. That is my presentation. Again, good news, negative 1% tax levy, 0% average for six years. Um, this, this, is, this has been a good year. Thank you, Mr. Manager. It's a good presentation you've done this evening and a good uh, budget that on the table for us to uh, consider. Um, and thank you, staff, for their diligent hard work over the summer and beyond trying to just uh, cope with the uh, this budget cycle and also just dealing with the pandemic uh, related to last year. Uh, you know, one of the questions I think we could, uh, as you're looking back at uh, 20 and 21, um, the various costs that you had to incur uh, during the pandemic and, and, and what things you're doing this year. I know the federal government came to help you out or help us all out uh, primarily, but uh, what, what, what are some of the big costs and that uh, took place last year, uh, perhaps even continuing this year, that affected our budget? Yeah, so, you know, uh, w one year ago, you know, uh, if I was in the same position, I still would have asked for that 1.95% because I didn't know what the next year was gonna bring. Um, but slow to find out, you know, we were going to be supported by state and federal government. So just in 2020, uh, we were given $5.5 million to help with COVID-related activities uh, from state and federal sources. Uh, in 2021, uh, it's been about $4.3, $4.8 million in supports uh, for COVID-related activities. So by and large, much of our expense has been covered by state and federal government, which we're more than thankful for. Uh, going on, we're gonna have to watch it because we are building in some costs, whether it's public health, um, you know, uh, just like post 9-11, there was a ton of grant money at that point, and then as the years went on, the kind of grants tailed off. We're envisioning, you know, in the next five years that that's probably gonna happen here, you know, or who knows, you know, COVID is changing the world, uh, but for the moment, with state and federal supports, we're, we've been um, granted the money to do all these things that we've been able to do. And what do, what do you see as risks in terms of uh, for the budget going forward for 22? Um, revenues we could be losing or just other increased costs that we could be incurring? Yeah, we, we, we got uh, help from the stock market going up. You know, we really did. That $2.7 million uh, uh, was good. Uh, FMAP is always concerned. You know, that's the federal portion of assistance that we receive from Medicaid. Um, you know, normally, you know, we, we, it's about a $35 million bill for Medicaid. Uh, with that FMAT support uh, is significant. Um, um, we know for a fact that we're gonna have that for the first quarter of, of 2022. We don't know if we're gonna have it for quarters, uh, second, third, and fourth. Uh, affordable, affordable Care Act, you know, we do over a million dollars of federal support there. Um, those are real numbers. Those are real drivers that, that could change things on a dime. Um, you know, uh, but m most, the only other concern is, is just the, the, the institutional building uh, of, of adding people here, people there. It's always the, the down years cost of, of adding a, uh, an employee or adding, because uh, uh, it's just, you know, you, you're usually bringing on board the person for 20 years. So it's 20 years of cost, but even though maybe you're getting, f you know, three or four years of, of grant funding. Mm -hmm. So that's where through management, you, you, you trip people, change people's positions. Uh, try and reorient what folks are doing, um, but those are real. But you know, Schenectady County has been been doing well. You know, we even in the pandemic year, our sales tax uh, came in good at 103 million uh, in 2020. Um, 2021, we're on track to to beat the 103 million this year. Um, so uh, you know, our mortgage recording tax went through the roof. Obviously, with home prices increasing, so we had an increase in line there. Um, uh, you know, I was just telling Mr. McDonald, you know, third quarter uh, hotel bed sales tax was a record. We've never brought in as much money on our hotel bed tax in the third quarter of 2021 as we ever had in the history of the county. Some of that is, you know, the four to five percent that we went to. Um, but, you know, expansion of government, uh, taking on too many new things would be my only primary concern. Because 
these revenues are good now? Are they good in two years? I, I don't know. Are COVID federal and state reports still there in two years? I don't know. Thank you very much. I know um, we've been here for a little time this afternoon or this evening, should I say. And what we'll do at this time, we'll just take a quick break and then uh, come back with uh, perhaps just one subject to deal with this evening and then um, we'll call it a night, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr.
Um, let's get ready so we can get started. We're going to jump into, well, when the TV's on, let me know. Okay, let's move to page 94. Uh, page 94, we'll just um, discuss the office of the sheriff. Uh, as you heard this evening, they're due to the street patrol, the street crimes, the targeted street crimes unit, um, issues related to the correctional facilities. So uh, we'll turn to uh, roughly, uh, their budget begins on page 97, and there's a few items of change. As you heard, the county manager this evening and also um, the sheriff uh, talking a little bit about the um, what's going on there in the targeted street crimes area and some of the changes that we're seeing here in the sheriff. Is this some comments? Any additional comments? Uh, just just quickly, the uh, uh, manager's office is, is seeking budgetary approval for one additional uh, civil affairs officer in the patrol unit. We're very concerned about when the uh, eviction moratorium ends there is going to be a bottleneck of many people that are going to be going through this crisis so it really makes sense to add an officer there so that goes to uh, page 99 and then we can jump a few pages over um, which is on page uh, 106 uh, it just relates to uh, items of the jail and jail medical services, and we'll continue from there. So page 196, and then you have um, pretty much uh, you know, all the way to page 110. Page 106. Page 106 to page 110. Question on canine units, and um, do we have enough capacity in this budget for canine? I know there's a lot of activity, schools and searches. Can we make sure that we have? We, we do. Uh, um, in, in capital, we'll be discussing some equipment purchases, some new dog purchases, a little bit of change in the canine world is, you know, uh, uh, the changes in, in laws for marijuana, you know. Um, so there's, there's some interesting things happening in the canine world, but we've made some appropriate additions. And frankly, the Schenectady County uh, um, canine unit is known for uh, how good they are. They do a lot of training out at the substation. It's worthy investment. So I thought, thank you. Are there any additional questions on the operating side for the, uh, the sheriff's office, the jail, um, corrections, targeted street crimes unit? Let us go to the small book. Um, as you heard this evening, um, uh, the county manager was actually just highlighting some of the uh, expenditures that we're looking to do in the capital budget for uh, the uh, sheriff relating to the substation and relating to um, some of the items there uh, for the uh, jail. And so those items are on roughly pages 36 and 37 of the, uh, 38 of the, um, of the capital book. And then they are also items that you see on, you know, pages 52 and on. So, um, so, uh, and a lot of it was actually explained here uh, earlier this evening. is uh, the jail addition roof replacement was something that we passed on last year. Um, so the, that roof really needs to get done uh, for the 380,000 that's on page 15. Uh, some of the uh, surveillance equipment asked from the uh, drug task force and street crimes task force, um, they don't have a lot of the surveillance equipment. So it's either borrowed from the city or the FBI. Um, so it's time to invest in their own equipment. Um, 
jail camera system. Um, we've had some situations where our camera system within the jail is very disparate. There are some blind spots. It's not safe for some of our corrections officers. And frankly, if, if there are crimes that happen, uh, we need to get it on film. It's completely standard in state penitentiaries. There's no reason why we shouldn't have it in our county jail. Do we have multiple Sally Ports in this jail? I, I thought we reviewed a Sally Port request going back, I want to say, four or five years ago. Is this? I'm looking to the sheriff. Jimmy. Just one. Uh, Rich, yeah, uh, speaking of the Sally Port, I think they're referencing the uh, set of doors that we use that accesses the Sally Port. The doors that are in need of repair. Um, were original when the new jail, as we call, was built back in uh, the early 90s. And uh, the steel buck doors are filled with concrete. And over the years, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the moisture gets inside and they're rusting out. So now it's creating a, a breach, if you will. So the only way to, to get at those, those doors to access is to literally take those walls right apart and refashion it from the inside out. So when they speak of Sally Port, there's a door that accesses the inside of the visiting area, and before you can get into the actual Sally Port area, there's a secondary door, which is again customary throughout the state. So those two doors, uh, they're just you know deteriorating. So those are the ones that we're talking about. Thanks for the clarification. You're welcome. amazed at the multifaceted aspect of the office of the sheriff especially when they're using jet skis uh, to get to solving you know people who are violating the laws and and solving the crimes that's out there so it's good to see that in this uh, in this county all right with that if there are no other further questions I would ask that um, we return tomorrow and we'll pick up um, uh, in the operating side and continue that uh, until we finish, whenever we finish. But thank you very much for being here this evening, and uh, I hope you have a pleasant evening. <laughs>